Secrets. Everybody has them, and somebody else will always be interested in that secret. Otherwise, it wouldn't be one, right? What, what are they? What are secrets? Well, actually, secrets are little things in our minds. Our brain is constantly re-evaluating those secrets in there. But for what? To keep us safe and keep us protected. But why do we need protection? We need protection because we want privacy. That's the main point here. In privacy, we feel relaxed. In privacy, we conserve energy. In privacy, we do things that we really wouldn't do in public, like uh, wearing a stretch t-shirt or allowing ourselves a loud burp. That's what privacy does to us. It gives us freedom. Now, I'd like you to think four of your deepest and darkest secrets that you have. And I'm not talking about the tiny little secrets, like um, you stole some cake from the wedding table before the party started. I'm talking about deep, deep, dark secrets that would really hurt your privacy if they got out. For example, like you, like, did you have a mistress or a, a secret lover? Or maybe that um, you have falsified some company reports that's to make you look better? Or that you're gay and you're not telling anyone? Or that um, you're not believing in God anymore and you're not telling it to your religious family? So think four of those now and imagine this. You have to stand up and you have to come up here on stage, stand with me here. Look everybody in the eye and everybody else watching the stream and on the internet and watching Facebook right now. And tell three of the four of the deepest secrets that you were thinking of. This is exactly what's going to happen in cyberspace in 2020. Three out of four of our deepest secrets will go online, will go public. And as a cybersecurity professional, I can tell you that this 75% of all of our sensitive data is going to hurt. It's going to be a big thing. Am I envisioning some kind of apocalyptic, no secret world? Maybe I do. But what I know is that in 2010, Mark Zuckerberg, I think everybody knows him, Facebook CEO, said this in a conference. He said that he believes that privacy is no longer a social norm. That privacy is not expected by society anymore. What I see here is that the world got very much interconnected. Before we had computers, and standalone computers had viruses too, but nobody cared, right? Because they couldn't infect anybody. But now everything is interconnected. So everything is voice recording today. The little board and in television studios and radio studios saying on air doesn't make sense anymore. Is there anywhere left that is not on air? Our capacities are growing. Uh, if you have a toaster in your kitchen, that electronic toaster has more likely more computing capacity than the navigating computer of the Apollo missions that actually put people on the moon. We're going to have 44 zettabytes of information on the internet in 2020. And we're going to store a lot of information in nanostructured glasses with the theoretical life acceptancy of 14 billion years. So we are heading somewhere, and it's very, very complicated. And in this big mess, does anyone actually know which information is important? We usually trust this with the users, right? The people. We let people decide what information is more important than the other. But I, let me tell you a secret. People are very bad in classifying data. They simply don't know the difference between uh, strictly confidential and top secret. Because simply, they're just people. Maybe lawmakers and regulations know the difference, but people don't. Have you ever heard anybody in a family saying something like, my son, your mom's birthday is strictly confidential information with restricted access? 
This is not happening. People are not like this. Because people are thinking in context. Context of the information and context equals value. Actually, it's context that gives the information and the data the value and not the content. And that's the point. That's the point what we're missing. Let's look at the magical armory that we have today in cybersecurity. First, let me talk about encryption, the holy grail of everything today. But let me tell you another secret. I think we, we are doing encryption because we don't know what to protect. So we encrypt everything. Let's encrypt the temporary files. Let's encrypt everything. But the point here is that if we encrypt everything, we are actually not encrypting anything. If the box is open with the toys inside and not encrypted, hackers can still move in and out. Have you seen any decline in hacker attacks because of encryption? I don't see that trend. But when we encrypt something, we do another bad thing. We are actually tying the hands of law enforcement people, like Vincent and his colleagues. And they simply can't fight terrorism, or they can't find, fight child abuse. OK, let's move to the next one. This is the magic sword of cybersecurity today, right? Risk analysis. Sometimes I'm calling it risk paralysis, because it does that to some people. So risk analysis is a nice tool, but it relies on self-assessment. And now I know a little bit more about people. And I have to tell you that anything starting with self is not a good idea in cybersecurity. Uh, the sec second thing is that many of the hackers don't really believe in audit reports. I think the, the Philippines electoral system has been hacked by Anonymous in two minutes. They got all the 55 million voters data out of the system, and they didn't really ask for any audit certificates, right? So there are problems with risk assessment, what I see. OK, let's bring the magic shield out of the armory. That's proportionate protection. Now, the problem is that everybody has proportionate protection. Proportionate protection is best of breed, state-of-the-art technology. Now, show me one vendor in this room or in this conference who doesn't have state-of-the-art technology or best of breed solutions. Everybody has that. So the thing is that, in a sense, since we all have best-of-breed products, we shouldn't have any hacking attacks, right? We shouldn't have breaches. What we, what we're having them with increasing numbers. OK, let's find the last thing, people. It's easy to blame them, right? Security awareness is always there to talk about. But the sad story is that people are just people. People are peaceful beings in nature. That's the reason for why not everybody's a security guard. That's the reason for why people are not blocking access to other people, to buildings. And let's take the example of OPM, the Office of Personal Management. They have been running security awareness programs from 2004. But that did not stop any of the Chinese hackers of the military exfiltrating more than 20 millions of data of the, of the persons working there and, 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 and officials and government people. Personal data plus 20 million. So actually we have secrets and not information. People not able to classify information properly. Protection is failing. This is what I see. And we're running out of time. 2020 is very, very close. It's a little bit more than three years from now. So that's how I started my journey into cyber secrets, because I wanted to understand how secrets are working, how cyber secrets are working. I've been accompanied by a wonderful person, a brilliant social psychologist, Susan Svetelsky, and she helped me understand people more. Uh, her research is really great on gossips, which is just a parsec away from cyber secrets, by the way. So I've learned a lot about people. And I've learned another thing. Whatever people know, about cyber secrets or secrets. They keep it a secret. I haven't found anything on secrets. So I had to come up with my own models. This is the process of risk evaluation for secrets. This is what your brain is actually doing when you're trying to assess the risk of secrets. You enter this circle 
and you go around. It doesn't matter where you enter. You will visit all of these bit stops. You, you, you make a contextual evaluation. Who is going to know about your secret? You will make a need evaluation based on the Maslow pyramid. Whether when your secret is out, will it affect me in any way? My physical needs. Uh, will it affect me in any way if I'm telling my wife that I got a secret lover, a mistress? Of course, it's going to affect my physical needs. It's going to affect my love and belonging. And finally, you assess the norm too. Am I breaking any norms? Religious norms, laws or regulations. And then we are done with that. We put everything into this really neat coordinate system and you try to find out whether it's going to be problematic or unpleasant if it's out. If it's problematic, I mean there are further implications, you most likely have a black secret, like murder. Or in an organizational level, a major downsizing plan you're not really sharing with anybody. Or if it's not really that of a problem, for example, you're wearing the same socks every night without washing them, right? It's not really a black secret, it's more like a white secret. It's gonna be very unpleasant, embarrassing if it gets out. So the point is that you have white and black secrets and everything in between are grays. When I realized that, I immediately knew that I had to put this in writing. But then I also realized that there's a big gap between what I see real and what people think real in this context. So even though I wanted to write a book for everybody, first I had to write this book for a chosen few. That's why the book became The Imperfect Secret. I've also learned that cyber secrets are changing all the time. They have value, they have status, they have quality. So they're more like shares rather than commodities. And also I dived into the recent attacks, the DC leaks, the DNC attack, the Panama Papers, and I found the same pattern. Dark secrets with very short lifetime for secrets are always out. And there are always people and software that are making mistakes on the way. By 2020, there will be 2.5 billion of messages and emails that will end up accidentally in somebody else's mailbox. That's a big number. And that's the problem. Users, people, software are making mistakes. So I thought that I should propose something as a solution. On level one, we can address the cyber secret paradigm with maybe using my model, somebody else's, for finding secrets in computers. Maybe you can, we, maybe you can use blockchain as a technology first. But then we need something else. We need a software that would recognize secrets for us and would warn us before we reveal those secrets to anybody. I'm not talking about information or data, I'm talking about secrets. On level two, we should address the privacy versus security dilemma that we have today. This is exactly what we have with the FBI and Apple problem, right? For that, I guess, and this is bad for humanists, I guess, bad news, we need machines, more and more machines, and artificial intelligence most of the times. My dream is that that device, that software, should go on every single computer and every single smartphone. Will know us better than we do. Will be the perfect digital assistant. And in the same time, will collect all the information of our wrongdoings. If we're doing something bad, like terrorist activity or something criminal, then the device will not tell anybody, the software will not tell anybody. When law enforcement will show up with a search warrant for the device, then all the information will be handled over to the people responsible, but only concerning that specific case that they're working on. So the point here is that I believe that in the first time in history, those computers and software will solve, resolve our very human dilemmas that we can't solve ourselves. But first, 
I'd like you to remember this. People don't have data. Companies don't have information. They have secrets. Thank you. <laughs>